All right, friends, welcome. Let's get started. So nice to see everybody. Um, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. So um, we are a lot of really wonderful things. Um, a couple a uh, couple cool notes. Uh, Stephen has some new sneakers that are pretty exciting to him, so that's cool. Uh, Sue is a grandma for the first time in January, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, Lucas and a lot of other people said the start of the holiday season uh, was really special for them. Sally in Indiana just had their first snowfall. So some of you are celebrating autumn colors. For some of you, it's already full-blown winter. Um, Elizabeth in Louisville is uh, is both pregnant and it's pizza week there. So that sounds super exciting. Um, Stacy Rome celebrating her anniversary. Uh, Bob Milton, uh, congratulations on 43 years of marriage as of this week. That's pretty awesome. Um, and Ron is celebrating that the Blue Bombers of Winnipeg are in the Grey Cup, which Ron, I believe is Canadian Football League, CFL. Um, but Maria or someone else can correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, so I think it's CFL. Um, so, so great to see everybody. Welcome. Uh, so, so glad you're here. Thanks, Maria. It is CFL. Um, and let's dive in. So we're going to talk today about uh, some writing best practices for fundraising, we're going to primarily focus on planned and major giving, but but a lot of this is sort of fundamentally true across all fundraising, and frankly, across all times you're asking anyone to do anything. So you may actually want to think about this with your with your staff, with your with your kids. Think about some of these things as well. Um, and at different points, we're going to really focus on how writing might be different in 2022. And uh, you know, it's not that you know the English language obviously is slow to evolve. But, but what would shift this year is sort of the macro environment that we're doing it in. And so, um, you know, we are sort of looking at some tougher economic times than, say, a year ago. Uh, things are sort of generally good from a historical perspective, but less from a, a last two years perspective. And so what it means is that the writing actually has to get better, right? That, that we basically have to do our jobs better than we used to be doing them in order to have some of the same results because the, the overall climate is different. So... Uh, we'll sort of make some notes about that along the way, um, but really cool. Oh, also, uh, I'm still seeing some of the intros. Um, Christine has had a one-year check, uh, and she is cancer-free in Nebraska. So congratulations, Christine. That's really great to see. Um, okay, a couple of housekeeping notes. We'll go through this stuff pretty quick, but pretty excited for Christine there. Um, this event is CFRE approved, 1.0 CFRE credits. Um, there is a question at the end in our survey. Um, and you have to just say, yes, you were here, help certify your participation. Very, very, very simple. Um, um, it's possible that CFRE audits are increasing. Uh, and, uh, and so just make sure to do that. Pretty simple. Um, here's the agenda, pretty straightforward. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, recordings and slides will be sent around later today. Uh, so feel free to take notes. Feel free to just sort of sit back and relax and sip your tea if that's what you prefer to do. Um, whatever your best best learning style is. All right, so quick intros. Uh, I've met a lot of you. My name is Patrick. I'm lucky to be the co-founder and co-CEO of an organization called Free Will. Um, we are very lucky uh, to work alongside 200 amazing humans. Uh, we've raised seven billion dollars for charity to date. Uh, we work with about a thousand nonprofits, and also Free Will is um, the number one estate planning tool in America. So that's pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, in my past life, well before Free Will, when I was a young person, and these folks were young as well, um, I used to do a bunch of ghostwriting for President Obama and on the political side, so primarily focused on fundraising. So whether or not, you know, whoever you voted for in 2008, 2012, you know, don't really care about that for this purposes. Um, but we do, what, what a lot of people realize is, you know, 10 million people um, were able to learn a lot about fundraising very quickly, run a lot of experiments. And so we'd constantly say this or this, you know, try different things understand what the most powerful writing was. And that really informs some of what, what I'll share, um, but also a lot of sort of psychological studies across the sector. Uh, we'll highlight some things there. Um, the other thing that we really like to do is we're just so grateful that you are here, uh, hanging out with us, uh, trying to make your career better, make your, make your work better, have a bigger impact on your mission. And so we are gonna send a present uh, in the spirit of the holidays to 20 folks. Um, some of you have received this in previous webinars. This is one of the best books. I think in existence, uh, William Zinster write a book called On Writing Well. It's probably about 40 years old at this point. Um, just make a note in the survey if you'd like a chance to get a copy, tell us your address, uh, and we'll go from there. So 
Uh, great, great book on effective writing. Uh, if you have, you know, kids who are teenagers or college kids, get them this book. Uh, get it for yourself. It's really transformative across the board. Uh, Selma says, great book. A couple, couple other folks have read it as well. Okay, so some interesting things when we continue intros. You know, we asked you all um, how you're feeling. Sort of interesting dynamic here. Um, this sort of blue line around happiness. Uh, back up after last week, I think people were feeling the crunch of being overwhelmed by election ads, which has slowed down a little bit, um, but also, also quite a bit more anxious. Um, so if folks have ideas on why that's the case, um, you know, please know that as well. Um, small note, I see some folks uh, typing in the chat. Uh, the, the survey at the end is basically where you'll, you'll be able to request the book. Uh, so feel free to do that there. Uh, don't need to put your address in now. Um, the other thing we're seeing is around confidence around hitting goals is actually you know, a bit lower uh, and, and relatively down from January. Some of that you know, is primarily the economy, but, just, but if you're feeling some trepidation around hitting your goals, you know, just know that you're not alone here. Um, and, uh, and that's just worth noting. All right, so let's dive into writing best practices. Uh, we asked you first how confident you are in your professional writing. About half of you rank yourself a four, right? Five being the highest, one being the lowest. Average is a bit lower than that. Um, but generally, you know, people feel like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in this work because I'm generally a strong writer, but I do have some room for growth. And so hopefully we'll be pushing this up, you know, just a little bit over the next, say, 40 minutes. All right, so what is good writing? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a good writer or a bad writer if you don't actually know what the goalposts are. And so some really interesting research uh, that, that we've really taken to heart um, good writing is clear. It's easy to understand. It can be skimmed for main takeaways. Remember that a lot of people are reading this relatively quickly. It appeals to a broad audience. And, and this stat is you know, really interesting uh, and probably should inform some of the way you communicate in your workplace on top of donors. Emails written at a third grade level receive 36% more responses than those at a college reading level and 17% more than those at a high school reading level. Now, sometimes people ask me, does this seem to be only true for some organizations, but not say a college where everybody went to college? And the answer is no, across the board, the, the sort of simpler, clearer, more direct messages tend to work, period. Um, and so this has really shifted some of the way that we think about uh, effective writing and supporting organizations in different, in different types of giving, also how changes how I've thought about uh, communicating this stuff, and communicating uh, internally with our team. So that's really interesting. Um, second thing is that it's concise. So one of the really big shifts in writing over the last, say, 10 years is the dramatic shift where people are, are across the board reading emails on their phones. So 81% of emails are now read on mobile phones. This is up for just half five years ago. So what does that mean? It's that means that your email four out of five times will be read on a phone and not on a desktop. We need fewer, stronger words. We need to cut out necessary details and we're keeping it short. What does short mean? Two to three paragraphs, maybe 50 to 125 words. Um, you know, make sure that if you have pictures, they show up on a, a, a mobile phone. And one of the key things here is that, um, you know, a lot of you are writing on desktops or writing on laptops and you're reading it that way. And Maybe you send it to a colleague or your boss and they're reading it on laptops. But really we wanna make sure that you're actually doing a quick scan of it on your own phone uh, as a way to sort of really see what it will feel like from the eyes of the donor. This is a big difference. Um, interesting. Uh, Keith, uh, who's been a Presbyterian pastor says, research indicates that in preaching and teaching, keeping it at an eighth or ninth grade level as opposed to a college level will engage more folks. So really, really interesting. Um, all right, so good writing is also persuasive. And what is persuasive? Persuasive is almost always stories of an individual over stories of a group and over statistics. Preventing statistics alongside an individual story actually decreases gifts. So you might say, here's a big story and 47% of Americans are just like Susie and 35% are just like Mike in this story. And actually that cuts it down. So when we've run some experiments here, uh, what you see on average, you know, this is like per letter, uh, $1.14 on just a statistical, $2.38 on an identifiable person, and $1.43 on an identifiable victim alongside stats. So the story helps, 
It's better than stats alone, but really just having the story of an individual um, is super helpful. Sometimes people ask, you know, we talk about victim here. This was the research uh, by UPenn. It doesn't have to be, right? So if you are raising money for your high school, you can tell the hero story of one eighth grader or one ninth grader, right? It doesn't have to, we don't, ne we don't necessarily need to traffic in, in like victimhood here, um, but it means that the, what we're really doing is focusing on the individual. Um, we're using repetition uh, or reason because, we'll use social proof, comparisons, we'll talk more about this as well. Um, emotion moves people. So a significant factor in determining how responsive people are going to be your message. And, and just as an important point, this is true whether I'm sending an email to 10 million people on the Obama list, or you're emailing one person who is a major donor to your art museum. This resonates the same way. So emotion moves people. Um, how positive or negative the words and emotion do it. Positive means great, wonderful, delighted, pleased, that you can imagine, negative. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed, I'm, uh, it's terrible. Um, that Boomerang ran that study, so thank you to Boomerang. But we don't wanna sort of go overboard. You can see actually on both sides of the emotional scale, it's okay to be happier, it's okay to be sad, angry, right? There's plenty of things in the world to be sad or angry about, plenty of things to be delighted and happy about, but you don't wanna be like, this is, you know, this is the apocalypse. You know, if, if we don't pass, you know, this thing through Congress right now, the whole world is going to end. Like that doesn't, that actually drops people off. We start to lose credibility. You can see actually on the left side of this little angry envelope, how deep it drops off when you're just like, you know, super hair on fire. And so there's some middle ground around what this looks like. It's really interesting to see. Um, so emails that were slightly or moderately positive and moderately negative elicited 10 to 15% more responses than the sort of like neutral stuff. Um, so that's really interesting as well. Give it, you know, give your next message a quick scan. Um, we're talking about strong storytelling, right? We sort of isolated, okay, what do we have? We're gonna, we're gonna talk about one person as much as possible instead of, you know, big stats. Um, this can also, by the way, let's say you're a land trust, you can talk about one piece of land or one sort of project. Right, the, the specificity is what really clicks here. Um, obviously, if you have an individual, it's even better. Um, you can talk about one animal if that's if that's your cause as well. <laughs> and so, why does this matter? Well, way more than statistics. Compelling stories activate the brain and strengthen emotional connections. Stories are remembered twenty-two times more than facts alone. Um, I know I'm telling you a bunch of facts right now, so hopefully it clicks anyway. 56% of people who support nonprofits confirm that compelling storytelling is what motivates them to action. Um, this is from the Science of Storytelling and Stanford and Nonprofit Tech for Good. Thank you all for that help. Um, why are stories so useful? It's because our brains actually light up in a way as if the story was happening to us, right? Narrative arcs produce love and stress hormones that affect the way we feel, it affects the way we act, right? Notice next time you're watching a movie, you know, what sort of part of your brain, or your, your chest is firing. Um, imagining that, that you're in these shoes. One experiment <clears throat> showed that participants who watched an emotional story and produced oxytocin were way more willing to donate to charity afterwards. Um, and so that is super interesting as well. So how do we write uh, great stuff that really is compelling? You know, we sort of now understand, okay, we need to write, um, we need to write, you know, about one person, we need to make it positive or negative, it needs to be emotional. We really want to elicit that response for folks. Um, and really we need to sort of like break through and peak interest. So uh, we need to get attention first and that will allow us and sort of give us permission to flesh out the story. So um, my number one advice for, for any uh, writer um, is that you are almost certainly, including all of you that gave yourself a five on, on how good a fundraising writer I am, you are almost certainly um, spending far too little time on the, on the subject line. Right. So this, you know, the right subject line is going to have 25, 50% better responses than the wrong one. And yet you sort of spend all time like, you know, anguishing over these paragraphs and you, you dash off a subject line. And that's not the right thing to do. You know, you'll still probably do it going forward, even though you know it's not the right thing to do, but I want to really name this. 67% um, of people say subject line emails, whether they're open it, they will open it. Frankly, the other 33% are lying. Um, nonprofits send an average of 63 emails a year. Nearly half of these are fundraising emails. People say, I need to stand out among all the other fundraising emails. Remember that nonprofit fundraising emails are like sub 1% of, 
of all emails that people are getting. And so you need to break through a lot more stuff than just other nonprofits. So how do we do that? Um, we really use what's called the curiosity gap. The gap between what we know and what we want to know. So in your subject line, peak interest, withhold key information to encourage open rates. Like pausing at a story at a climactic moment. We're introducing the idea, introduce an idea that has an unlikely outcome and do not overpromise and underdeliver. And under deliver. That is clickbait, right? Irrelevance is the top factor that turn people off of an email. But what does this actually look like, right? What we're saying is, I really want to know the thing that you promise in the subject line you are about to tell me. A uh, couple of examples, the best way to help in December, 2022, the two most impactful steps, a tool that is getting a lot of use. I thought of you today, a new trend we are seeing, what this student accomplished this week, right? And you see all of these and you would get a sense of, you know, you know, to just take a quick look and say, you know, which of these would I open? Probably most of them. If you get an email that says, I thought of you today, if you got, if you got a, uh, an email saying, this is the best way to help in December, um, and a new trend, these are going to get opens, right? And I see actually relatively low quality subject lines from a lot of nonprofits who are otherwise very, very good at what they do. Um, and partly we're just not, you know, it doesn't mean that, that they're sort of not smart, but really understanding what the goal of the subject line is and what, is the, what are the ingredients of a successful subject line. And it's really this curiosity gap. So I hope that's the first thing you take away. Second thing is we now have, remember people are reading things on their phones. Um, then the, there's sort of an old research that shows that an average woman reads an email for seven seconds before deciding whether to continue to read. And the average man reads for only two seconds. So uh, you have a very short amount of time after we hook supporters, with the subject line, we have very little time to catch people's attention before they move on. And so what does that mean? It means we're starting with the most important info, right? So we, we have this curiosity gap and now we need to start delivering the goods quickly. You know, whether it's the update on your organization, whether it's big news about your work or mission and how you are providing value to the reader, right? What is the case for me spending my time on reading the rest of your message? So a couple of examples on what good looks like here. One. You know, you make it a list of spring cleaning for spring cleaning. Here's one thing you actually need to do. I wanted to share what person X did this week, and I hope it makes you really happy, right? You can imagine someone be like, oh, well, I'll go read. Like, you know, if you're promising that it's going to really change my mood, I will read that. You know, the class of 2023 is facing three big challenges right now. Well, now I want to go read what the rest of it is because I was the class of 1985 or 2005. Um, so I hope that makes sense too, right? We've got our curiosity gap. And then we're really trying to grab uh, attention with the opening of our email. Um, third, the core of not just a story, but motivating someone to action is what we call the impact gap. So what is newly possible with the support of a donor like you? Right? We're defining the present moment. This month, our animal rescue took in several new litters of kittens. The problem is that our shelter is facing rising pet food costs and kittens need extensive veterinary care. With your support, we can make sure these kittens get the food and help they need to be adopted and thrive in their forever homes, right? So you can now imagine, you know, you might not be an animal shelter, or maybe you are, and you can just copy and paste this. But if you're not, you say, what is happening right now? What is the main problem? And what will be solved by the intervention of this donor, right? Or this volunteer, right? This, this sort of, you know, holds true across the board. Um, and tangible impact always, always wins, right? So one share of stock could provide 80 meals. This scholarship will help one lower income student shift the course of her life. A gift from your IRA will help us reach the 90% threshold for the class of 1965, right? So you can see in that third example, a different type of impact, but it's really clear, right? We're only four people away from hitting our goal of 90%. Will you help you know, get us across the finish line? But everything here needs to be more specific, um, there's some really interesting research by our friend, Dr. Russell James, around how specificity, it tends to be what drives really large gifts. Right? And so um, a lot of people ask, well, that's great, but my boss just wants me to raise money for the general fund. And there are different ways to do specificity, right? You can say this, you know, this gift um, you know, is, is legally bound for X, or you can give an example of what X buys, and that can be really useful. 
Um, before we move on from this, you know, I sort of promised that we talk about what specifically happens in 2022. And this is really, really useful, right? We'll talk more about anchor points later, but everybody has an anchor point, right? So, so humans are just sort of, um, you know, we sort of, we think about things relatively as opposed to objectively, right? If you make $40,000 in America, you are objectively in say the top 10% of world income, if not higher, right? But you might not feel that because you might be on a block where your neighbors are making 80 or 100 or 120,000. And so relative, you know, your view is all relative. Um, the same thing is when we think about spending, right? So especially in an inflationary environment, especially in a recession, you don't want the donor to think, oh, mm, $500, that is 10%, 5% of 20% of this, this month's paycheck, right? What you do want to think is, wow, 80 meals, that's a lot. That feels like a steal, right? Changing the course of someone's life for only, you know, X amount of money, that feels like a bargain. And so are we anchoring on the price compared to income or the price compared to what it's going to do? And that's a really valuable component, especially as we think about fundraising in this environment. So um, I hope you'll keep that. Um, tone of voice matters. So, you know, sometimes we find that fundraisers are sort of writing like what they think adults sound. But what you really want to do is write it as sort of a, you know, a warm letter to a friend. Like you're speaking to a close friend or a family member. Some people will even pick someone uh, that they think is sort of emblematic of their donors, but they're really, you know, someone they're close to and keep a picture by their desk and write to that person every time they do a fundraising email. So we're using simple human language. This is true, especially by the way, when we're talking about complicated gift types. So we're talking about some of these larger gifts out of your IRA or stock, being extra human there instead of trying to sound like an accountant. Um, super helpful, cutting out jargon and big words. Uh, here's a little bit of an example. Um, the more formal terms that we use, the less interested people are, are in participating. So a study tested the phrase, make a gift to charity in my will versus make a bequest to charity. Now you might sort of know what a bequest is if you're a normal donor, but you might not. Gift to charity in your will, pretty straightforward. 23% said they were make, interested now in making a gift. Only 12% said they're interested now in making a bequest. Right? So what we're seeing here is almost doubling this impact of the same message without jargon. So this is really important, right? We want to help you sort of work smarter and not just harder. And so if you're already doing planned giving outreach, you know, let's make sure we're scanning for some of this jargon so you don't cut your performance in half, which would be, you know, pretty disappointing across the board. Uh, number five, lead with humanity. Um, so does anyone know what, what this is a picture of? Anyone have, um, anyone in the chat recognize this? Great. So UT Austin, um, UT Austin, right? It's, I don't know if anyone here is a, is a UT grad, um, uh, but feel free to shout out. Great, Lorraine uh, Huckham. And uh, congratulations. So Lorraine, um, UT is going to write you and ask you for money, right? And UT has a $43 billion endowment. And you presumably don't, right? Uh, Sandy and Samuel, jo oh, Joshua's horns down. A uh, couple, couple, maybe A and M or other folks around. Um, so UT, you know, in a normal world, UT would be sending you money. These people, you know, the endowment is fabulously wealthy, and you presumably are not a multi-billionaire. If you are, you know, congratulations. But so what? What can't happen is you cannot. If you're UT, and some of you might might even be there, you cannot write as the institution because the institution is not a sympathetic character. Right? You want to remove the we as much as possible. You want to keep communication personal with an I, unless you're writing for multiple people. And by the way, don't write for multiple people. Right? The, the only sort of reasonable time it's, it's useful to write for multiple people is you know, it's your, it, you know, from mom and dad. Right? It's from, from the sort of couple. And so maybe it's two people. But you're rarely, you know, people don't write emails on behalf of 40 people. And by the way, if you have a personal connection to the cause, make it known. So here's an example. A 2011 study found that people have a harder time saying no to appeal when the advocate or the writer has a personal connection to the cause. They don't want to be seen as disrespectful or uncaring. They may not be more convinced of the merits, but they're more motivated to take action. Um, so here's what that might look like. I'm writing today on behalf of the University Alumni Foundation. Because of the foundation, I was the first person in my family to graduate college. I'd love to tell you about the work we're doing now to help more first-gen students reach their full potential. Do you have five minutes to talk on Tuesday? 
Think about the difference between this and I'm writing on behalf of the Alumni Foundation. You know, do you have five minutes to talk on Tuesday about, about potentially you know, doing more funding? The gap here is pretty remarkable. Um, and so uh, pretty, pretty helpful. Um, tip number six, um, you know what's happened to social bonds? This, by the way, is particularly true of millennials, but it's really true across the board. Um, sorry, we can hear a little bit of a, a alarm in the background. Um, philanthropy, <laughs> pause for a second. Okay. Um, philanthropy is a social act using the mechanisms for family bonding, right? It, charitable giving is rewarding and activates reward systems in the brain, one associated with receiving money rewards, even though you're giving money away, and one associated with social attachment and what we call affiliative reward system mechanics. Basically, like I am now nicer, better, kinder in the eyes of my peers, right? So the social bonds are really important. The way to motivate action is often by telling the stories of other supporters, ideally who are similar to the donor you are writing to. So for instance, right, a couple of folks just mentioned that they, uh, they went to UT. If I were to tell you a story about someone who graduated UT, was about your age, joined a fundraising team about seven years ago and did this one specific thing that they found super successful, you would be highly motivated to do that thing. And that is very true of your donors, right? So don't say, hey, you can save up to 80% on taxes through giving stock, even though you can't, right? That's a reasonable thing to say. You might wanna say, hey, someone in the class above you, also from California, just donated stock and got an almost 80% tax benefit. Do you wanna learn more about her gift and what, what made her excited about this? That is a very gentle way to exchange information in a way that really piques interest from the donor. So this is gonna be true in writing and also in your conversations with major donors. Another example in plan giving, um, there's some great research, I believe it's out of the UK, um, where we ran three experiments in, in, in terms of getting new plan gifts or new gifts in a will to charities. When we said nothing and just said, okay, you know, make your will, about 5% of people reference charities. Now, unfortunately, this is sort of the norm in estate planning. When you asked 10% of people, pretty good, doubled it already. And when you talked about other people choosing to do this, would you then like to do it yourself? You tripled the rate of not asking. And so, you know, slight shifts here are gonna result in tens of billions of dollars in additional giving, which is pretty exciting. Um, so keeping up on this, Elements of effective donor stories, they're donor-centric, they focus on the impact of the gift, they focus on the background of the donor, they don't necessarily focus on the size of the gift, um, but as we're telling stories people can relate to, you really want to tell living stories as opposed to deceased donors. Why is that? I have a hard time relating to dead people because I am not currently dead, right? And so I really need to hear about other people who might have put a gift in their will but haven't passed away yet and what they expect that to mean for the legacy they're creating over the long term. Um, reasons. This is super important. The word because is another massive shift, right? Don't say please donate. Say please donate because when you make a request, you will be far more successful when you provide a reason. You can almost double your success rate in some of the research that we've seen. And so make it clear why you're asking for donations. Um, here's a little bit of examples to help you out here. Today, we're sharing Sophie's story with you because you have the power to improve her life. We need your help because millions of lives are at risk right now. We're asking for your donation today because we need to build a new shelter before winter comes, right? Look at that last one. Like that is really punchy uh, as opposed to just saying, hey, you've supported us in the past. Can you please give again? And that's really, really, really meaningful because it, it combines the sort of because with urgency. Um, super helpful. All right, personalization. So who, who is sort of the, the person that everyone in the world is most interested in themselves? Um, hearing your own name triggers greater brain activation. So, um, you know, if you, are, if you are a man born in the 90s or the late 80s, you know, Joshua, Jacob, Mark, Michael, you know, these are going to be really sort of common names. Um, if that is one of your names and I just said it, you are now listening to the slide more than the other people, right? And, and anyone with us, those names can confirm or deny this. Um, but it's because hearing your name triggers greater brain activation. And this is particularly true 
in the parts of your brain that are associated with social behavior and long-term memory. It tells your brain to pay attention and that information is relevant to you. Um, anyone, does anyone have like a history teacher who, if you were drifting off, they would just say, you know, and, and the reason that's so important, Patrick, is because it was the third stage of the French Revolution or whatever, right? And you'd really sort of snap back in just by hearing your name. Um, it also gives people a greater sense of control and reduces information overload. So I think this ends up being a little bit overdone in the subject lines, but when you think about personal emails, uh, this can be really useful. Remember and refer back to information your donor has shared with you as much as possible. Uh, if you have major donors, when you are writing to them, include their favorite piece of art, their pet's name, their class year, their kids' or their spouse's names. You want to send progress updates for causes they've previously donated to, and you want to name specific dates when possible. Every one of you has specific giving dates in your CRM or your system of record. And so when you tell me, you know, I, I went to Georgetown, I occasionally give money. Uh, I also feel like they've got tons of money, so sometimes it goes elsewhere. And what, what the most impactful message they can send to me is, you know, two years ago on September 15th, you gave 200 bucks. By the way, 200 bucks contributed to programs like X, and these are the results we're having. Would you be interested in giving again? Right? And that, that information is, you know, all in your database. You can even sort of auto upload it for many cases. And it's really, really, really important. Um, Elizabeth says, can you say more about naming specific dates? Um, you know, you, you might say, because you're a person, right? You're a person working in this organization. I was just looking through our records and I saw that, you know, in advance of our calls, you, you know, you gave this really great gift last September 17th, right? So you, you know, it's not sort of overlord, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not sort of deus ex machina. It's just you as a human, um, you know, this was my day. I sat down to write this email, you know, and, and that really actually helps people connect. 80% um, of consumers are more likely to buy from a brand that provides personalized experiences. That will be true for nonprofits as well. 58% say they prefer to hear from an individual versus the org. And 60% are inspired to give from requests by donor relationship managers. So this is uh, super important. And right? we really wanna be connecting as much as possible and demonstrating specificity. So I wanna share a couple of bonus tips before we get to some resources and answer some questions. The first in our research is we wanna use framing that educates. People like learning. This is especially true when you're talking about some of these more complex giving types that are a win for your donors because they're better tax savings and a win for you because they're bigger gifts. You want to acknowledge that this may be new so that they don't feel like I'm expected to know this and now I feel stupid, so I'm just gonna withdraw. This can trigger curiosity in your prospect instead of making them feel like they should have known this already. Try using, did you know? You might be surprised to learn. Um, the other thing you can do here, by the way, is not even put it on them. Other donors in a similar situation were surprised to learn this. Can I share it with you? And that sort of gives people the space to say, oh yeah, I'm open to learning something new, right? Other people in, uh, in a similar situation to you were surprised to learn this, right? Go try that in your next writing, in your next sort of interaction, either in writing or in person, and let us know how it goes because it, it tends to have very strong results. During Make a Will Month, which some of you participated with, August, you know, I think close to $600 million in new charitable giving allocated, we tried three different frames and our innovation team worked really hard on this. One was around join the movement, right? So social media or social proof focus as much as possible. Second was make your mark about a legacy. And three was did you know? And, and really educated folks on the reasons to make a will or the reasons to include a planned gift. And this education framing actually performed the best of the three. So it was really, really good opportunity for us to be sharing info with donors. Um, it's great for planned giving. It's great for major giving in, in particular. And it's a great way to start the conversation around estate planning. We are here to share stories and resources that make a difference in our communities. That's why we're spreading the word about the importance of having a will, right? What this message says is, I am here to provide information that we think will be valuable to you. And because you are doing that, I am here as a, as a reader, open to that because you've expressed this as your goal, right? You are trying to help me by sharing good information. 
It also solves the issue of asking donors for larger gifts, because when you educate them on more impactful ways to give, this ends up being a lot, you know, these gifts tend to be a lot larger. Did you know the gifting stock avoids capital gains taxes, and most donors can also claim an income tax deduction for the stock's full value? This means the full value of a gift goes to helping our mission, right? It's really helpful. You can also see, by the way, that this is sort of fourth, fifth, eighth grade language, um, really simple. Many of your donors want to make a larger impact, but they're not always aware of tax savvy options that allow them to do so. So things like repetition is key, right? Nonprofits that sent information about stocks to their supporters uh, at least twice were 50% more successful in gift generation. All right, so multiple education, especially on these really big gifts will generate a lot more giving for you and it's really, really important. When we talk about two, we wanna focus on the, this is around for, for my plan giving people, focus on the legacy of legacy giving. Research shows that mentioning death decreases a person's interest in making a legacy gift. Reminders about death cause two reactions. One is avoidance, don't talk to me about that. Two is the pursuit of a lasting impact. And that second one really is what you want. Um, instead of talking about this, focus on communications on how donors can create a legacy. Avoid language like leave a legacy. The leaving is the death part, right? That's not the fun part of creating a legacy. Creating a legacy or making a gift or something that is proactive as opposed to leave, right? Walk off stage and leave us your money, right? This create, make, really empowers you as opposed to makes you sort of like an afterthought in it. Um, and so that tends to be a lot more helpful as well. So feel free to do this as well. Um, uh, is tip number three, um, when you are talking about plan giving, and some of you asked this question, how do we talk about plan giving without being awkward? One of the best ways to do it is include age ranges when making plan gifts. This will help older donors feel less targeted and like part of a broader audience, which they are. Example, supporters of our humane society from 18 all the way to 88 choose to include us in their will or trust. Would you like information on how to join them? Now, if I'm 90, well, maybe we say, you know, eight to 108. Um, if, I'm, if I'm 85, I don't feel like, man, I got, I got targeted by this plan giving because this organization is waiting for me to pass away. Instead, it's a collective effort. And by the way, your plan giving should be a collective effort because all those folks need to make wills and all of them have the opportunity to be a gift. Uh, one more thing I wanna note is you wanna ask for a tribute bequest. Many charitable bequests are in honor of a loved one. In my will, this is an example uh, from some of our research, I have a gift to cancer research. My father died of cancer, so I've supported them ever since. In 2014 surveys, one in four people, so pretty, pretty meaningful chunk of folks, increase their intention to leave a charitable bequest when given the options to honor a friend or a family member by making a memorial gift to charity in my last will or testament. So this is another big avenue as across the board. Um, and then one more, uh, one last point on, uh, as we think about sort of navigating 2022 in particular, in tight times, which we are in, you want to remind donors of their wealth. So asset gifts remind us of our wealth. Cash gifts remind us of our income and feel a little bit scary because boy, things have tightened up. There's an experiment, we talked about this a little bit, I believe two weeks ago, but just wanna, wanna remind people as we go into end of year fundraising, some shoppers entered a marketplace and they were asked, what's in your wallet? Cash, credit? Others were asked, do you own stocks or bonds? And the shoppers who were asked about stocks and bonds ended up spending 36% more at the market, right? Equally hungry, same sort of people, you know, um, not that crazy. And yet suddenly, um, just a lot more. So um, naming this as a particular area to do it, people who feel wealthy act charitably. People who are reminded of their wealth feel wealthy compared to people who are reminded of their income who feel less wealthy in moments like this. Um, when we college students were asked to report their savings, when using a scale ranging from zero to 500, as opposed to zero to 50,000, they then increase subsequent donations. Remember when we started out the conversation saying everything's relative? Well, if you're at the top end of that scale, suddenly you feel wealthier and you're ready to give more. Um, so that's uh, really important. So how do we remind donors of our wealth? 
We want to ask them about investment gifts in every single email, right? This is sort of new, uh, new guidance, but based on this research and sort of the extrapolation of it, even when you are asking for cash, ask them about investment gifts as well, right? So thank you so much. We're really trying to give, uh, we're really trying to build the shelter before winter. Therefore, we're asking you for a donation today. By the way, you can also give out of your investments, stock, crypto, or retirement accounts. Now, sometimes this is good because it lets them know they can donate these. These are a lot bigger, right? So we're going to get some of these really big gifts. But also, it should increase the size of the cash gifts that you are going to get because now we are reminding people of their wealth as opposed to their income. So as you think about staring down a recession and many of your donors, especially these folks who are baby boomers, who may be retired or maybe sort of like, you know, in their last few years of working um, are looking at their income, but also they have these really big IRAs, these really big um, stock portfolios, maybe their real estate wealth is quite large. And so when we anchor people on that, you're going to get, even when they're not giving you stock, they're going to be getting you larger cash gifts. And so this is, I think, one of the, the parts of non-cash giving that is deeply understated and under, misunderstood, that it's not gonna sort of distract with more options. It's going to remind people of how wealthy they are. And I uh, would be very curious if anybody wants to sort of run this experiment with a big email list uh, and we can help prove it out together. So super important. All right, so um, that is a wrap on, on some of the information. I'm gonna share some resources in a second. Um, my marketing team, uh, who I love, always asks us to make sure that we're putting in a little plug for free will. And so please allow me this grace for about 90 seconds. Um, people tend to love free will and working with our team, which is we're so proud of. Um, so a Ronald McDonald house in the Intermountain area, they restructured their fundraising department. They partnered with free will to grow their, their plan giving program. They got 67 new bequests quite quickly, $1.6 million in new bequest commitments. Um, all this was, I think, in just uh, the first year. And so you're really starting to, to get the ball rolling. Uh, Cooperative Baptist Fellow Foundation, our friends over there, say the bequest tool and the regional feature ships allows us to reach a broad group of individuals I could not focus on before. Instead of only talking to wealthy donors about plan gifts, we can now cultivate a lot more people and still want to give. Um, and they've been really successful. Katie, our friend over there, says, I'm usually juggling so many balls between campaigns, social media, events, et cetera. That probably sounds familiar to some of you. The free will team makes it so easy for me to promote plan giving. All I have to do is cut and paste. doesn't require a lot of my time, and it's made it really, really wonderful. So thank you, Katie. Um, all right. A couple of resources for you all because we want you to be, you know, I, I hope that you found this useful. Um, I hope that you learned a lot. I also hope you can now put this stuff into practice, right? And so that it's not just an aha moment, but it actually changes the way that you work going forward. So a couple of resources help with that. First things first, um, and my colleague June is going to drop a, um, a thank you, June, before I can get it out, um, a note, a uh, link to the survey. So that should be the last thing in your chat. Um, and we are going to send a book uh, on writing well to 20 people as a gift. This is a great book. So please make a note in the survey if you'd like a chance to get a copy, tell us where to send it. Um, Suzanne, just to, just to give some extra props for this book, says, I used to teach English and I use this book. So if it's good enough for Suzanne, it should be good enough for you. Other resources. Um, we have put together a whole writing guide on how to craft effective emails. We also have a guide on nonprofit storytelling. And so feel free to take these. You are now an expert. Feel free to share them with people at your organization that have not, uh, that did not join us today. Um, so that's another resource. And by the way, if you're ever interested in partnering with Free Will, we would love to talk to you. So there's a small note in the survey, just say, hey, I'd love to connect with someone. Free Will tends to be a good fit for organizations in the US. I'm sorry to my friends in Canada, we are not there yet. We will be at some point um, with at least a million individual contributions or about 5,000 email supporters, right? That tends to be a pretty good fit. We're doing a little bit of exploration on slightly smaller organizations. And so let us know if that's you. Um, but right now, the big focus is on that top group. And our best-in-class tools, uh, again, number one estate planning tool in the country, driving literally you know, billions of dollars in bequests every year, which is pretty exciting, uh, tools for helping give out of retirement accounts, uh, tools for stock gifts, and tools for crypto, which a lot of people are navigating for the first time right now. So 
feel free to ask about any of these across the board. All right, so let's, that was fun. Let's dive into some questions before I do, because I know some people are gonna have to go. So let me first say thank you for joining. We are going to do our next session on November 29th. So that is two weeks from today. We will not do it Thanksgiving week because you all are gonna be traveling and navigating traffic and hopefully cooking up a storm. Um, but in two weeks, we are going to tackle uh, the wonderful concept of millennials in fundraising and what millennials are gonna need to see at the end of the year to be able to turn into some of these major donors that we're expecting. So can't wait to see you there. Um, yes, so um, we will uh, dive in. So a couple of questions we see. Um, does the emotional quotient, meaning the sort of emotional impact change based on age of recipients? Um, Sarah, we have no evidence that that is true. So I can't promise you that it's been run individually at every five-year income uh, age bracket. But for the most part, um, the best practice tends to be across the board and, and certainly works uh, for both young and old folks. Um, I saw that stats presented alongside a story de that decreased response. Is there any reason to use stats? Any reason? That is such a good question. Um, I'd be curious if other folks have thoughts in the chat. I mean, um, my head says yes, but like the evidence says no, that there, there sort of aren't meaningful ways where it's going to increase giving. Um, so uh, it, it's very hard. Um, uh, Ami writes a suggestion in grants, in the annual report, you know, things like that. Um, very, very tough. Uh, and so, you know, you can respond if people ask for it, but for the most part, it's not going to drive um, that, right? So great question. Um, uh, Jill says, please suggest great subject lines for event invitations, besides join us or invitation. You know, something that might be, um, an event we think you'll really enjoy. You know, we'd love to have you at this event. Think about that as a subject line. And then you click on it and you say, oh, well, what's the event? Oh, okay, it's a annual gathering of X. It's an alumni event, things like that. You know, that's really useful uh, across the board. So uh, that's helpful. Um, uh, great question. Uh, this is a really good question for Kelly. Kelly writes, I work for a child advocacy center where we do child abuse assessments. So hard, you know, tough work and thanks Kelly for doing it. Um, we cover five rural and frontier counties. Stories end up being compilations of situations in order to protect privacy. This ends up being stories that make me cringe because it's not totally authentic. Any suggestions? Kelly, this is a tough one, right? Because um, oftentimes you can generalize um, a bit. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cringe as much, right? As long as you acknowledge, you know, somewhere, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to tell you about the types of stories we see every day, and then you can sort of go through it, right? So you're acknowledging that it's sort of a broad, you know, encapsulation of what you're seeing, but then really tells the story from the view of one individual, but acknowledging that this is sort of an encapsulation, right? Private, you know, details have been changed to protect privacy, and if you say that, you then give yourself permission to really dive deep into that story. So um, thank you so much. Um, other good questions. Um, and uh, C asks, anyone have advice for convincing a boss that familiar, friendly, writing is better than formal and technical. Um, here's how I would think about it. First, we're going to align on our goal, right? Like, hey, boss, you and I have agreed that we have this really ambitious fundraising target, and we both want to hit it, right? Well, there's this interesting research that shows that responses at a third grade level, eighth grade level, and here's the recording of it, uh, shows that actually we'll get higher response rates. And because our goal is higher response rates and more money, I would really like to try this. Um, 
if they strongly disagree and say, oh, great, well, let's let's maybe do a side-by-side -side comparison and see what works because I would love to learn more about this. And, and I know this might be an area of learning for us across the board, right? So instead of just sort of badgering them with notes, um, that might be, that might be there. Um, Janet says, are you saying we should never use leave a legacy in any of our printing materials? Janet, this is sort of the same story. Like you might say, oh, well, sometimes the research shows that it's worse and that leaving is the sort of negative verb that people don't want to do, right? It's always sad to leave something. Creating, make it, you know, like become a part of our society, you know, all these things. This, this is sort of the proactive where you can make the, the, the donor the hero of it. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I would, as much as possible, scrap, scrap the leaving message. Um, it's just, it, there's no research that shows it's better. And so you're much safer without that. Um, Carolyn says that, that their brochures say, create a legacy of love, which is a really uh, important thing. Um, one last question. Linda says, if your nonprofit is cultural, not disaster related, do you have any tips? Um, it, this is uh, an area where urgency is actually even more important to build into your writing, right? So if there's a hurricane bearing down on Haiti and the Red Cross is raising money right now to be rapid response, they just have to tell you what's happening, right? Like, um, you know, obviously effective writing is still useful there, but a lot of the work is done for you. If you are an art museum in South Carolina, you still need to build urgency to drive action. Here's an example. Right now, in, in a week, I'm sitting down with our director to map out the plan for the spring exhibit. And we really want to do this ambitious thing that we think will excite a lot of the children in the community and a lot of the adults and help put South Carolina on the map as a cultural institution. We need to know by Wednesday, you know, what sort of fundraising we might expect. And so I really hope I can count on you for at least $2,000 so we can help do X, right? And you build in all that, that sort of urgency around the planning you're doing, the people that are going to come, the deadlines that you have, and you can still do that even if it's not, you know, hurricane, famine, et cetera, right? And so that's a really important, you know, good writing is even more important to those institutions. So I hope that's helpful. Um, okay, uh, that is it. Let's wrap up there. We'll give everyone a few more minutes um, just before their next session. But but want to wrap up uh, just by saying uh, thank you for being here, for pushing yourself. There is a lot of busy stuff to do. Um, and we, we uh, know it's really important for you to be uh, what Stephen Covey calls sharpening the saw, right? Taking this time to really improve uh, your own skills. And we hope it's worthwhile. So please, if you haven't already, please fill out that survey. I think June might drop it again in the chat. Um, it's really valuable to us. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Super grateful to you all and see you on the other side of it.